You prepared your kids for their first steps. The first day at school, their first dance, that big test, all the wins along the way. With a College Savings Iowa 529 plan, you'll prepare them for even more. Register before May 31st for a chance to win a $1,000 contribution. Visit collegesavingsiowa.com to make the first move toward a bright future. College Savings Iowa. It's how parents get through college. Administered by the State Treasurer of Iowa. This episode of the DLU Podcast is brought to you by Goalie Nutrition. As someone who's used Goalie for quite some time, I can tell you that they're not only very good, but they're very beneficial. My favorite are the Super Green Gummies. The Super Green Gummies are uniquely crafted with a spectrum of essential nutrients such as vitamins A, B12, folic acid, and theamine. It supports a healthy liver function, healthy nervous and immune system, digestive health, a boost to your metabolism, and overall health and well-being. There are no artificial sweeteners, flavors, or colors from artificial sources. They're vegan-friendly, gluten-free, and gelatin-free. All loyal listeners of the DLU podcast get a special 10% discount at checkout. Go to Goalie.com, use promo code D-L-E-W. That's Goalie.com, use promo code D-L-E-W. This podcast is a Believe Network and Luciete production. Welcome to another edition of the DLU Podcast, brought to you by Believe Network. I'm your host, Derek T. Lewis, and I have some exciting news for you guys. You know, coming this August 25th, so we're about a month away, uh, my my brand new single, Espacion, will be available on all platforms. That single is featuring Angie Stars, someone that I met about a year and a half ago, and she brings tons of energy to the record. You know, I'm so appreciative that she was able to collaborate with me on this music project. Huge shout out to her team, you know, Sparks, uh, Edwin, uh, Divine Fury, Classic Tunes, everyone from her team that, you know, she brought over to, you know, to work with me, you know, on this project. I am super appreciative of that. The song is going to be incredible. I can't wait for you guys to hear it. You know, we shoot the video soon and it's on from there. We just have to do a lot of promoting and uh, we hope you all can come along for the ride, you know, for this uh, this record that I that I wrote many, many years ago and is coming to fruition right now. But speaking of music, you know, this week I have an artist out of Texas. Her and I met back in Miami in, uh, in November at a music conference I was at. And, you know, just just a ray of sunshine. You know, she's amazing. Um, Jimmy Thais. And we talk about you know, her growing up in Texas and what was, you know, what was childhood like for her, you know, growing up there, you know, how she got into music and, you know, what she's doing, you know, now and everything with her music career. And let's not wait any longer. My interview with Jamie Tai starts right now. Well, ladies and gentlemen, on this episode of the TV Podcast, I have recording artists. The one and only Jamie Thais. Welcome to the show. How are you? I'm doing great. How are you? I'm doing great. Thank you for asking. I appreciate that. So, you know, we've been talking about, you know, doing this episode for a while. So I definitely appreciate you um, taking time out of your very, very busy schedule to, you know, to come onto the show. And I learned something that you're from Texas. So what part of Texas are you from? I'm from Texarkana, Texas, which is about two and a half hours from Dallas. Oh, okay. So is the Dallas Fort Worth area? Okay. Yes. yes. So tell me, tell me about what was life for you growing up in Texas? Well, in Texas, um, people think of Texas as just country, but Texas is actually a a pretty laid back place. After I look at how uh, different places are around the world, Texas is really chill. Like we kind of we kind of standoffish and where I'm from in Texarkana is people rarely know this area. Like we literally have to say Dallas for people to be like, oh, okay, okay, Texas. Because Texarkana is just not, it's just not known like that, should I say? Yeah, because I mean, I, I literally this is the first time ever that I've ever heard of that town before. So I'm glad you you pointed it out as far as the distance between 
there in Dallas for sure. Yeah. So what was life for you growing up, you know, in tech, just overall, what was life for you growing up as far as in Texas and the, how the childhood was? Um, well, I love Texas. It was fun. Um, growing up here it was pretty fun. We did a lot of outside should I say, like, the kids don't do that today. It's all about technology. But, mm -hmm. hey, in Texas, we were, like, outside. Um, the lights, even when the lights come on, we still outside playing. <laughs> we like animals. We playing Fear Factor. Like, Texas is one of those where you, you, you're going to have fun in Texas just because it's the outside type of thing. Right. Now, you said Fear Factor. Are you talking about, like, the TV show? Fear Factor. Okay, now, you're going to have to tell you, you're, okay, you're right here, right now on the D-Loop podcast. <laughs> Tell me, how do you all play Fear Factor as kids? Tell me. So, you know, we have ditches, right? Yeah. Ditches where people live. So my mom, she has this huge ditch, which we also have a neighbor that's actually connected with my mom. So they, we basically share the ditch. But theirs is just a little bit deeper. So we watched Fear Factor growing up all the time and wanted to try different stuff. So we would love for it to rain because when it rained, these, um, the ditches will fill up with water. Well, we right. take our bikes and we go through the water, you know, in the bikes and the person that, you know, is able to stay up on the bike, even while going through the water, they will be the one to win. But most of the time we would all fall and end up in the water and have to run and dry ourselves off before we get home because mama would be upset if we came home drenched in water. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah. I I see when, when I, when I think about the show Fear Factor, I think about, you know, worms and this and that's something we, like, oh, we did it all we did it all oh wow well that is mighty brave of you okay. yes <laughs> we <laughs> ate mighty. ants we ate mud pies like we 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 did it all we oh, we wow. were some wild kids down here in texas <laughs> wow um well again you are you are extremely brave my friend that's for sure now you also said that you started writing music at the age of 10 you know you were writing songs for church choirs and, and things you were performing in church you know you read you you led your first song in church when you were 12 and you shocked the whole room and no one knew that you could write that you could sing so what was that process for you when did you develop that feel of being able to you know you write when did you d develop that love so to speak for writing music well, I've never really been shy as a child. I would always get put on front street to like recite poems, do readings and different things like that. So I kind of being in church, it was like you couldn't be shy because if they knew you were shy, that's when they really would put you on front street. So I would, I would kind of be prepared. I would right. prepare myself mentally and then emotionally because most of the time people are only scared due to thinking of what other people are going to say, say. about things. Me personally, I was kind of just like, hey, I'm going to do it and I just feel good because even if they won't do it, I will. So that's kind of where I was with that. Okay. Now, what was the first artist that you listened to that got you into music to begin with? I love Michael Jackson. I love Whitney Houston. I'm I'm a laid back person when it comes to music because I like soul singing. I like singing that you can you can feel it, not just hear the song and like it for a couple minutes and time goes by and you forget about the song. It was just always something that their voice could do to me while they sing the song you you can tell that they that they cared about what they did mm -hmm. sure now what now you mentioned Whitney Houston and um got I mean and, and Michael Jackson God rest both of them but um what records from from both of them that caught that that really caught your eye or that that, that really said you know I really enjoy listening to them. What were some of those songs that you that you listened to? I love We Are the World Michael Jackson that's one of my favorites uh I'll be there just it's it's the songs, it's the lyrics, it's the way it makes me feel. Whitney Houston, um, it was more uh, I Will Always Love You. Um, she also did a church song, I believe, I Have Nothing. Okay. That's one of my favorite songs due to, you know, different things that I've dealt with in my life. That song kind of brought me out of a lot of dark places. So, um, yeah. You know, it's, a, it's amazing you said that because a lot of times, you know, and I've said this in an interview before, that music can really set the mood. You know what I mean? If you're obviously if you're in a good mood, of course, it's going to even get you in an even bigger mood. But of course, if you're in a dark place, 
songs can actually bring you out. You know what I mean? So recording artists, we as creatives, you know, we have the job of making sure that we're giving the people what they want. You know exactly. what I mean? Because without without that, it's just like, there, there's times, trust me, in, in my life, even now, it's like, I may put on a song if I'm not really feeling, if I'm not really, I'm in a bad mood or whatever, I'll put on one of my favorite artists and it's like, right. okay, you know, it's back. So it's almost like that therapy. You know, music is indeed therapy. You know what I mean? Now, when did you know that you wanted to be a recording artist and do this for a living? I want to say it was COVID. Me sitting at home, I've always wrote stories. I've always aced a lot of my writing tests in school. They would always be amazed at how I write because I would definitely want to tell a story that would make people be like, oh my God, where's the next story? You know, where's the next story? Right. So it was definitely, it was definitely things um, like that that made me be like, you know, I really want to do this. And like I said, COVID had me at home and it had, it gave people time to think. It gave people time to open, open their ideas, their mind up to the many things that they could do because a lot of people didn't know the things that they could do until COVID happened when we were stuck with nothing but to be at home and sit around. Right. So people kind of came out the box with things that they found out, you know, that year or things that people let go of years ago. That was me. That was something that I let go of years ago with growing up, having kids. You kind of stray, stray away from things as you get older. And I kind of just wanted to touch bases with it again because I always felt like that. Anything that's like on my heart, I'm, I'm just supposed to let it off my heart. So that was one thing that was like deep on my heart. Like if I'm not pushing my pen to create this book right now, then I just need to show my talent and, and, and what I can do. And that's writing. Wow. So you, so, so you actually years ago wanted to be, you know, be a recording artist, but you said you had, you started a family and things of that nature. And, and that actually took precedence for a little I kind of didn't even want to be a recording artist. I really just wanted to write stories. I just kind of put, I wanted to do it in a different way. Should I say, because people don't cling to books so often nowadays, like people right. aren't interested in reading books. So it's one of those where you have to tie people into you first. And then after they love you and love what you do, they kind of just, they move with you. They love the story and they they're down to listen to the journey. Very, very true. So where did you go to say, okay, how do I get into, how do I get into the business? Like when were you, when, when did, like, during, obviously during the, during the uh, pandemic, how did you go about now say, okay, I'm going to do this. When did you start putting the wheels in motion? Well, I went to the studio and I actually recorded my first song, which was Dangerous. And after I did Dangerous and after I heard how it sounded, because one thing about hearing a song in your head is totally different from when you actually bring it out of your mouth, because I've been in the studio where I couldn't even hit the notes that I could think of, <laughs> if you know what I mean. And I'm just kind of like, man, I want it to sound this way, but, you know, you can't. After Dangerous, after I saw how I wrote that song and put all my feelings that I had from my past in it, and I heard it. It just kind of made me want to keep on going. I was like, oh, God, I got to write something else, you know, because once you write one thing and it's good, you kind of want to see if you could do it again. So I experienced that very I, I experienced that very same thing. I was just talking to an artist about that a few episodes ago, and I was talking about when I did my first record and it was supposed to have been a one and done. Because I was like, all right, I just want to just see if I can do it. Exactly. And after that, I'm gonna put I'm gonna put the baby to bed. Never. And then after that, I'm just like, uh, what can I do next? Right. And here I am. So I totally get what you're saying. So was there any fear on your part in regards to saying, okay, I'm really gonna do this for real? Was there any? Um, were, were you anxious about it? Were you excited? Or was it like all bottled up in the one? In the beginning, I was it was it was a lot of fear because 
that was me opening up a side that a lot of people had never seen. A lot of people were blown away whenever they even knew that I could sing or do any of it. And it's it's a lot of pressure for that first release where you're expecting, you, you want to know what people think about it, but then you're kind of like, you know, people may not like it, people may like it, you know, and for your first record, you kind of get more you get people tuned in because everybody's anxious to know what it'll sound like, what it'll be like, if you even make sense. So I, I can say I was I was very fearful mm-hmm. in the beginning. I was worried about what people were going to say, which I'm so far from there now. And I'm, I'm thankful for that. But definitely I was definitely fearful for in the beginning. But I was excited because I knew I, I knew the record was pretty darn good. <laughs> So when so when you when you finally finish you know obviously recording getting it mixed uh-huh. getting it mastered what was the process of you really now you say I'm going to release this thing what how did that put in motion so that I actually created a video I did a video I did everything by myself as far as marketing I got my fans together I didn't have like a team I didn't have anybody it was more so me doing a whole bunch of research before my release because I waited like I talked about the song for almost a year until I put it out so I had people so ready to see what the song was going to be like and that was due to research on how I should um, put out my music I definitely had to build a uh, momentum before I released the single because a lot of people do think that you could just release a song but you really have to it's a lot before releasing the song is the last thing <laughs> right and and that, and that's a good and that's a good way to um talk about the business end of things because if there's any you know aspiring artist that's listening to this episode right now you know listen to what Jimmy is saying because it is so true it is it is 10 percent music 90% business, as the infamous uh, JPW likes to say. Shout out to uh, Jonathan P. Wright and Patience J. over at uh, Radio Pushers. And it's true because there's so much that goes into it. First off, you have to have make the people be, number one, make them aware that there's something that's coming. Now, exactly. you, you also have to make them care. How do you make them care? Hey, invest in yourself. You know what I mean? Because when when people see that you care and they see uh-huh. you're passionate about what you're doing, they're going to be passionate with you and for you. Exactly. So that's a big, big piece of advice that we can share with you all today is the fact that when you're do before you put out anything, you know what I mean? Make sure, like I said, you have all your ducks in a row when you're ready to market because you have to promote in any way possible, whether yes. it's Obviously, social media is a huge tool, but also to going out and, like I said, and get flyers made. I know I did. And you'll be able to hand them out in many places, whether it's a club, Mm -hmm. a bar, um, anywhere, you know, a karaoke bar, wherever you can and hand them out to people, you know, and but but the the people are going to see it. So that's just a little piece of advice that we have for you. I didn't mean to hijack the the, uh, episode here. But But that's true. So true. Now, what were some of the challenges you faced so far in your career? So within my career, challenges that I faced would definitely be like um, financial. Uh, Financial. Uh, Only because growing up, we were already poor. I'm not going to just say poor where we didn't have a roof over our head, food to eat. It was more so like we just weren't, it it was more of a paycheck to paycheck, you know, with my mom. My mom was a single mother of four. Mm -hmm. She has uh, me, my sister, and I have two brothers. And we grew up with just my mom. Like my dad wasn't, wasn't around. So Mm -hmm. growing up poor, you, you don't necessarily want to be that way, but it kind of goes with the flow, you know, until one person gets out of that situation. Cause you know, with families, it can go just, you can, it can keep going down. Like that family's poor, that nobody's made nothing of this. A lot of that helped me to do what I'm doing now. Like it's a must that I prosper because I don't want that chain to just keep going on because no one has tried to break it thus far. So it's like, if if no one else will do it, why can't it be you? One hundred percent, and I think that, and that's where I think you have to really 
when you talk about betting on yourself and yes, just believe for sure wholeheartedly that this is what you're doing and you're going to overcome as many obstacle obstacles as possible because there's going to be so many roadblocks some things that some that are controllable and some that are uncontrollable right it's all about how you react and how you and how you handle it head on you know exactly what I mean? so another piece of advice from this episode of the dilu podcast now what have you learned though from being in the industry from people that you know I learned to definitely just uh, do me for sure. Like um, I'm not worried. My focus is on what I have to accomplish, what I have to do. And I think that's where a lot of people mess up is that they look at what so-and-so is doing. I don't look at how fast the how fast another person is moving. Mm. I look at, you know, what can I do to help me to move up? Not to outdo anybody, but to outdo myself. You know, because if we are, if you are betting on yourself, you're definitely taking chances. You're in competition with you. You're trying to be a better you. So that's, that's like one of the main things that I've learned is that it's not a race. Because in the beginning, I would be like, man, why do they get that? And I'm working this hard. Why haven't it happened for me? You know, but right, right, at the right. same time, my I'm, my time is going to come when my time is supposed to. So I've accepted that everything happens when it's supposed to, for sure. This episode of the DLU podcast is brought to you by Goalie Nutrition. As someone who's used Goalie for quite some time, I can tell you that they're not only very good, but they're very beneficial. My favorite are the Super Green Gummies. The Super Green Gummies are uniquely crafted with a spectrum of essential nutrients such as vitamins A, B12, folic acid, and theamine. It supports a healthy liver function, healthy nervous and immune system, digestive health, a boost to your metabolism, and overall health and well-being. There are no artificial sweeteners, flavors, or colors from artificial sources. They're vegan-friendly, gluten-free, and gelatin-free. All loyal listeners of the DLU podcast get a special 10% discount at checkout. Go to Goalie.com, use promo code D-L-E-W. That's Goalie.com, use promo code D-L-E-W. Never ever, never be a carbon copy of somebody else, man. Like I said, what, what is, what's, right. meant, what's meant for you is meant for you. What's meant for them is meant for them. Yes, indeed. I've definitely learned that. Mm-hmm. Now, how would you describe Jimmy Taisa's musical style? I would describe her as a <laughs> a late seventies, eighties, groovy, laid back soul soul singer eye catcher like I'm more of a I just want to bring like happiness whenever I sing like I get this um like a little groovy feeling whenever I'm doing my music because it makes me happy to deliver in that way where I, I'm not with like rapping and stuff like that like granted there's good rap songs and stuff out there but Jamie Thais is more laid back she's mellow she wants to to make people feel her whenever they listen to her music or hear her speak or, you know, all that. Okay. Now, on that note, though, where does your music fit in today's realm of R&B? I definitely feel like it fits in that, um, in the R&B bracket for sure. R&B soul. R&B soul. Okay. R&B soul. Okay. Now, there's a record that I did listen to, and the acronym is called PTTOM, mm-hmm. with uh, featuring our artist uh, Bruce Aaron. Mm-hmm. Talk about the song, what that acronym means, and let <laughs> the people know a little bit more about it. Sure. Um, so, PTTOM stands for Put That Thing On Me. And <laughs> <laughs> that's what that stands for. <laughs> All right. She, yes. Ladies and ladies and gentlemen, she said, put that thing on me. Yeah, put that okay. thing on me. <laughs> okay, let's talk about it. Okay, so PTTOM came about. I was literally in my bed and I'm saying to myself, like, I'm about to get on B Stars YouTube and I'm finna look up a fire beat because I just want something groovy. And and that's right. how I am when it comes to my music. I'm kind of flip-flops because I'm an emotional person where I it depends on my feelings. You know, a lot of times when I do soul songs, those are based on my past feelings about 
old things that I used to think about. I've already wrote, written stories about them, and I just kind of put that in another way. But when I do my groovy music, I think about like the club and having fun. And, you know, I want people to be able to bob their heads and, you know, move to the beat and stuff. PTTOM just came one night when I was just chilling, thinking. I went to the studio and I literally did that song. And I told Bruce Aaron, because he's also the one that recorded this song. Mm -hmm. um, I told him, I said, hey, I, I really want somebody on here. I want a guy on here and I want it to be fire. Well, he literally got back to me like the next day and he had wrote that verse and he was like, I love that song so much. Like I had to. Yeah. And he like, he wow. had it done. I was just like, man, I love the verse. You know, I loved it. And we kind of just went from there. I waited maybe um, 10 months in between and I end up putting it out. Um, it's actually starting to get the recognition that I was looking for when I first dropped it. But now, since I look at how I do things now, the marketing, if I would have marketed better, if I would have um, did a few things differently with putting the song out, it definitely would have, it would have went way further, but it's still doing numbers. Like I get messages about that song every day, whether you believe me or not, every day I do. <laughs> People I mean, love that song. I mean, it's catchy. You know what I mean? It's very catchy and you did an outstanding job with the record. And again, thank you. And it's, and, and again, to your point, you said it's not a sprint. It's definitely a marathon. So continue to push you know what i mean continue to push in any way you possibly can now let's talk about some of the producers you have worked with though talk a, bit, a little bit more about them and and some of the influences that they had on your on your music and what you learned from them okay so um jesus met is actually the guy that produced he's on my instagram as well he's actually the guy that produced dangerous when i actually saw this beat on YouTube, I messaged him because I'm one of those people that before I even put out a song, I want the producer to hear it. I want their feedback. I want to know how they feel about it. And most of the time when I do that, they give me awesome feedback. They're kind of just like, oh, wow, you you got a voice that we, you know. So I, I, I'm really happy when I hear things like that. But Jesus met, um, he actually had the record um, for sale and ended up actually giving me the beat for free. I let him hear Dangerous. And he just really was, he was shocked. He was amazed. He asked me to send him the link. He's actually from Italy, so he doesn't speak English. Uh-huh. So when I sent him the record, he was just like, wow, it sounds so good. And he sent me a message back with um, him actually loving the song and he told me he was like i love you i love you i love you you know like i, I love the record it's it's, a, it's genius like it's fabulous i wish i could have pushed it more you know like with some of the records that i have i really wish that you know you always do that whenever you kind of learn more as you grasp more about the music and the industry you kind of think about man i wish i could have did things differently but what it has done is helped me to develop this discipline and this patience that i didn't have before right for sure and, and again i mean it's, it's evolution right it's mm -hmm. about learning you're learning what not to do the next time rock lesion is another person uh i did i need your love he actually that's actually his beat okay and uh, he's a pretty cool dude. I have had conversations with him. I've sent him a few a few tracks that I have recorded that he's made the beats of. So it's been every producer really that I've kind of done their like got on their track. They they're loving the jams. P Dub is actually the guy that is the producer of PTTOM. He loved the track. Now, <laughs> he thought the track no. was amazing. Now the two other gentlemen were they are they from Texas or they are they from out of town as well? Uh, P Dub is actually from out of town. The other guy, I'm not really sure where he's from. I want to say that he was from France. When we talked, he said the same. So I've kind of been touching bases with people that's like way out. Okay, got it. What do people misunderstand most about you? 
I think people get the wrong perception when they look at me, but I'm starting to love that, I guess, because most of the time when people see me that and I say that I'm an artist, they they look at me as a rapper. They're like, oh, you rap. You know, like I give off this persona, I guess, that I may rap. You know, if you look through my pictures on Instagram or just any of that, uh, people really get me confused with rap. They think I'm a rapper instead of a singer. And when they hear me, they're kind of just like, especially when I talk. When I talk, they're like, oh, no, you have a dominant, deep voice. So they kind of tell me, you sound like you could sing, you know, so... That's that's mostly what people misconcept off me is they think I'm a rapper. They think you're a rap. Wow, it's interesting because I mean, even with me, like a lot of times they'll ask, you know, what do you like? What like what what, what genre do you do? You know what I mean? Because they want to know. And when I say EDM, they're completely surprised because a lot of times they think, why would you? Why would a person do dance music? Well, because it's different. <laughs> yeah. Know? For sure. And what's beautiful about music that is we have the freedom to do whatever it is that we want to do. You know, like we don't have to pigeonhole ourselves into a box where we're just going to just do whatever what's expected of us to do. I don't care who you are. Exactly. Uh, male, female, whatever. Like if you're if you're in position to do R&B soul, fine. You know, if someone's in position to do country or whatever it is, great. As long as you as long as you love what you do and you're being productive at it, it's all that matters. Now, what has the feedback been from some of your family and friends about the music you've been putting out? What's the been, what's been the support system in that regard? So when I first began, I felt like I had that support, and as the journey continues, you know, the people decline. You know, people, you know, some people in the family, some people that's friends, you know, when things don't move at a pace for other people at a time that they think it should happen. Like some people, when you're doing something like my mom totally didn't understand whenever Dangerous came out, she was like, I don't get it. I don't understand how this song happened, blew up. I don't know how people don't know this song. And I'm just like, mama, it's uh, it's so a process. It's so many, it's such a process that it's so many people in the world that's talented as well. They hear people, people hear people all day, every day. You know, like it's like nowadays, you gotta have to stand out, you know, to, be seen you don't have to do the most but it has to be something that's catchy that's different that people could be able to cling to that people can be able to make a topic off of Mm -hmm. exactly like a lot of times too is like don't be i would say don't be cookie cutter but don't do what like what what everyone's doing or what's expected or what's exactly or what's trendy no, because what, trending is only what's happening at the current moment. Exactly. Our job is to make timeless music. Exactly. And I think when you talk about R&B soul, like you think about this for a second. When I think about R&B soul, I think about Mary J. Blige, right? I love Mary J. And I've, you know, I've been a fan of Mary's for, you know, since her, since Real Love came out in 92. And her catalog is, 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 is in, it's incredible. You know what I mean? But what she, the table she set 30 years ago, people still play real love today. People still play you remind me today. <laughs> I mean, name the song. They, they still play of, of hers, they still play it today. So it really I know I still play Mary Jane I, all night long. I still play um without you. I still play my life, the whole my life. Like I, I just I, I love Mary. She helped me with that's what I'm saying when it comes to like what she went through in her life, because her journey is what literally had me attached to her because you can, you can feel yeah. her pain and her music. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Everything, there was nothing, the, everything about Mary was so authentic. Authentic. Yes. Like you can literally like you could like when, when you're listening, you can just feel, feel her pain and the thing that she's, that she's experienced and that's why i think and again that's what creates longevity is the fact that you can make timeless music make mm-hmm. timeless music even if you're an actor you know if you play a legendary role that people could talk about 13 10, 20 30 40 50 years from now you know that's what that's all about so it's that's all what about, it's about about the quality of the music not just 
doing this for hits here, here, here. Now you want to right. make something that's going to last a very, very long time. Now, what does give you inspiration when you're writing? Definitely my past, my present, me looking at my future. All of that gives me my inspiration from now. And when I say that, I'm meaning um, putting my past behind me, but being able to come forward and live in my truth and just accept my past for what had happened because being stuck in the past and not being able to do anything about it, feeling wise, it leaves a whole bunch of pain and stuff inside of you. It makes it hard for you to be able to accept love from other people or to love other people. You know, like it, it, it really can be hard. And when I say like my present, now I've overcame all of that. So when I'm overcoming it and I'm living in today's time, I'm able to appreciate me being able to be an over overachiever of what I have went through before. And when I say my future, mm -hmm. I'm just talking about since I've overcame and I know what I want in my life now, I'm determined to go forward with what I know I want. Right, 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 right. Now, what do you wish you knew before you started your career? I wish I knew all that it all that it took to <laughs> to be legendary. It's like everybody does so much now that it's 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 not easy anymore to just put your talent out there and expect somebody to just be hip to you, you know, like it, it really does take. And when I listen to Jay in class, and even when you've talked before, you can you can tell that it's, it's not as easy as it was back then, you know, like it's, people say it is because they say we have all the tools like social media and stuff like that. But you have to think about it, like it's billions of people that have social media that could upload the same, the same content Matter of fact, they can upload content to the same song you upload content to. But if they do anything different that could catch somebody else's eye and it trends, yours don't, yours won't matter anymore. I think this. I think the industry is way oversaturated. I don't mean that in a negative sense at all. Please understand. I just it's oversaturated because now it's like because of the tools that we do have. Yes, you know what I mean. So. It's all about how do I slip through the cracks where I can I can't get noticed, and I'm not talking about doing anything goofy or stupid or anything, but I'm right, about right. Really, the quality of it, and how do I catch someone's eye? And it's and it's really and it's all gonna take hard work, hard mm -hmm. work, hard work, hard work. Now I know we were in Miami um a few months ago, mm -hmm. and and I know you had an opportunity to you know perform and everything. So what's next? What's on the horizon now for Jamie Thais now that you know you have the music out? You know, you've it's been getting you know spin on um 99.7 the heat Miami down in Miami, Florida, and it's been getting a uh, spin down there. So what's next for you? So I'm actually planning on working on that book that I was just talking about that I'm writing. I'm also looking into sending over tracks to K-pop because I love to songwrite. Not really too much of a performer, but I will perform just because I don't mind and I like doing things where, you know, like we talked about performances, that's your time to shine. Spotlight's on you. You know, so I, I like that. I think that's pretty cool. My first time actually performing was in Miami. I've been asked to come to several shows in different areas, but it was nothing like the conference, if you know what I mean. Like, I'm not a showcase person. I'm not a competition person. So when people invite me to sing at those, I'm not willing to go forward with it. I'm only willing to like grow my brand and expand on my brand. And that was like perfect for me to, I knew that God would have me to go where he really wanted me to be at to perform. Like I've been to New York um, to perform there, but I actually turned it down when I got there due to some crazy things that happened. But it's literally just like all about trusting the process and, you know, staying connected. And I'm very well connected with my team. Like, I love Radio Pusher so much. Awesome. And I, and I love them. And I love them, too, for sure. Now, before we get out of here, give the people your social media, your website, and how they can keep up with you and all of the things of, of the world of Jimmy Tice. 
Yes. So, Jamita East, this is all for the gems. That's part of uh, the reason why I chose this name, Jamita East. Uh, my name is J E M, and people tend to call me Jamisha, but it's Jim, Jamisha. So, for the gems, you can always find me at Jamita East on all platforms. Jamita East. And feeling good. Okay. Well, first off, again, like I said, I know you have a pretty hectic schedule, so thank you so much for coming on to the show. Um, I look forward to seeing your growth in all aspects, whether it's music, whether it's writing, you know, books, wherever the case may be. And like I said, you're, you, now that you've been on an episode of the DLU Podcast, you are now part of the DLU Podcast family, which means you can come back anytime you want. So I thank you so much for um, giving us your time and um, best wishes to you, all right? Thank you so much. All right. Well, that does it for this week's edition of the DLU Podcast. Again, I want to thank Jamie Taish for stopping by and telling us what's going on with her music career. And I wish her all the best in what she continues to do. Regarding the DLU Podcast, again, getting brand new content, whichever streaming app that you're on. I don't care if you're on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, um, app, um, Amazon Music, um, iHeartRadio, whichever platform that you're on. Hit the subscribe button so you'll automatically get all new content of the DLU podcast every time there's new content up, uploaded. So make sure that you do that. Subscribe, subscribe, subscribe. Speaking of subscriptions, as far as you can actually follow me on Instagram, threads, Twitter, TikTok, at the real DTLU, Facebook, Derry T. Lewis official page. You can also go to my store, shop.derrytlewis.com, so you can get some really cool tees and hoodies. And again, don't forget, go to my bio, click the link, and pre-add, pre-save my latest single, Espacion, that's coming August 25th. Make sure you do that. It's available right now for pre-save on Apple Music, Spotify, and Deezer. Okay, make sure you do that. Well, I'm going to get out of here, and as I always say, no matter what it is that you do in life, always remember to make it count. See you next time. The South Dakota Stories, Volume 7. My trip to South Dakota was the best summer ever. Now I don't need to go to Mars because I've been to the Badlands. And I caught a bigger walleye than Dad when we went to the Missouri River. Then I rode my bike through these huge rocks called needles. Ooh, I also saw my first herd of bison, even a fuzzy furry baby one. I can't wait to go back and see more. There's so much South Dakota, so little time.